all to so many of you who over the last few weeks have offered me little notes of encouragement, emails, cards, uh, your thoughts, prayers, sometimes food. Food is really appreciated by our whole family, but I had my uh, hip replacement surgery three weeks and two days ago, and while it's not something I would tell people to sign up for, uh, it's a great blessing to be on this side of it and to be getting better every day, so thank you so much for your concern and your kind thoughts over the last couple of weeks. Well, when my wife and I were first married 31 years ago, I kept the checkbook. It wasn't anything we really thought about, but in the house I grew up in, my dad kept a checkbook, so I just assumed my job to keep the checkbook, so I did. Turns out my bookkeeping skills were not really my strongest suit. For example, uh, when I got my very first checkbook, I think uh, right about when I went to college, I um, decided early on that it was easier just to sort of round off the entries in my checkbook. So if I had to write a check for pizza on a Friday night for $7.61, I would just round that up to $8 in my checkbook. If it was $7.21, I would round it down to $7.00 because it was easier to do the math and all that, and I figured in the end it would all just come out even. I mean, you can laugh, but that was just my theory. That, was my, that, that worked for me, okay? Well, we got married all these years later, and I continued to do the same thing without my wife knowing that. I, just, I was keeping the checkbook, and I just kept rounding off, but the numbers were bigger, of course. About five years into marriage, almost exactly five years, my wife somehow discovered my technique, and she was, she was kind of aghast at that technique, and then she, furthermore, she discovered that we had five years of unopened bank statements in boxes that I just stacked up. I got them from the mail. I just put them in there. I didn't even open them up. I figured the bank knows what they're doing. I round off. We're good. <laughs> so she went through all five years, every single page of every single bank statement. I don't remember how long it took her, but she went through all five years. Turns out we had $700 of interest in our account that I didn't know about. I told her, see, It works. But from that day on, she has done our checkbook the last 26 years or so. The truth is, I was just lucky. It was completely unintentional, and I think we would all agree that an unintentional investment strategy is really no investment strategy at all. Isn't that true? Today we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about a very unique kind of investment strategy. Our summer series is called The Way of Blessing, The Kingdom of God in Everyday Life. And we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, among the most famous things that Jesus ever taught, and so far... We've looked at how the way of blessing is counterintuitive to us in our culture. It's kind of upside down, kind of an upside down kingdom. The way of blessing we saw produces salt and light. We've said that it means that every follower of Jesus is to be a blessing, a gift to his or her neighborhood, and every church is to be a blessing, a gift to the town and city in which it's located. The way of blessing both satisfies and supersedes the law of God, the righteous requirements of God himself. And last weekend, Jeff talked about how the way of blessing is the way of purity, what our sexual relationships are to look like in the kingdom of God. Powerful message. If you haven't heard it, go online and listen to what he has to say. Now, today we're looking at the way of blessing as the way of generosity. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to continue right on going through the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 19. Listen to what Jesus has to say. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the first thing I think we see here as we take this apart is Jesus is talking about two kingdoms. There's two kingdoms. When I was 14 or so, my brother Joe, about 11 or so, uh, our family was invited to spend a day on the boat owned by a family in our church. Now, we lived about 40 miles north of New York City. This family um, had a tw uh, about a 50-foot yacht that sat in Long Island Sound. I was away at camp or something, so I only know this story through how my 11-year-old brother told about it when I got home. Uh, 
My brother had never seen anything like this before, and so they spent the morning on the yacht. He thought that was absolutely the coolest thing he'd ever seen in his whole life, a 50-foot yacht. We actually knew people who owned a 50-foot yacht, and our family was invited. Really cool thing. Then at lunchtime, the mom and the other family had lunch delivered to the yacht. I don't know, maybe on a dinghy or something, but it comes to the yacht, and it included several large plates, you know, those fancy meats all rolled up with the toothpicks in, stuck in them. And to my brother, who was 11, this was the, the, the like, pinnacle of human opulence, was to have little rolled up meats with the toothpick stuck inside. And just about that time, he was, he was considering the greatness of the blessings of his life, to have friends so wealthy, a huge yacht floats by, a 250-foot yacht floats by. At that moment, the mom of the 50-foot yacht goes, that's how the other half lives. <laughs> now, my brother was smart enough at age 11 to do a quick calculation in his brain. And he came to the conclusion, if that were true, if there were two worlds out there, the world of 50-foot yachts and the world of 250-foot yachts, our family lived in neither world. <laughs> and it bugged him. See, Jesus here confirms that we all live in two worlds or two kingdoms. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. There's the first kingdom. We all live in that kingdom right now. We're living in the kingdom of of earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven there's the second kingdom we also right now can live in that kingdom here we'll talk about that in just a moment where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also so jesus here is telling us that as his followers we live in two kingdoms at the same time first an earthly kingdom which requires an earthly investment strategy. We have treasures. Some of them are invested in this earthly kingdom. I've often commented that I have always enjoyed mowing my lawn. And I know that everyone feels the same way, but I've always got some sort of weird self-esteem from the nice neat rows of mowed grass, diagonals, patterns, you know. Uh, I just get some sort of, I think I got it from my dad. My dad, to this day at 83, loves to mow his grass and brags about it after he mows it. Um, well, years ago, I thought it might be appropriate for me to pass on this joy to one of my sons. Uh, so I took him out and told, taught him how to use the lawnmower. I wasn't sure he was getting the whole joy part. So. But then one summer day, out of the blue, he comes up to me when he's like 12 and goes, Dad, can I mow the lawn today? I thought, yes, that's my boy. Chip off the old block. He's got the same thing. He's demonstrating the initiative, work ethic, catching on to the true meaning of manhood. And then he said, will you pay me five bucks? I'm broke. Now, to his credit, he wanted the money to buy his cousin a birthday present, but he was already learning the necessity of an earthly investment strategy, right? He's already learning the necessity of money in everyday life. Jesus is fully aware that we live in a real world. He was fully aware that we have jobs and bills and mortgages and college costs and insurance deductibles, that we live in a world where an earthly investment strategy is necessary and even good. We don't often think about Jesus this way, but Jesus understood the necessity of money, and he knew how money works. Jesus, we know from New Testament record, likely spent his early adulthood running a small business as the oldest male of the family after his father had evidently passed away. He ran the carpenter shop. They'd learned from his dad. He had to support his whole extended family through that shop. So he knew about bills. He knew about work. He knew how money works. In his teaching, we see he talks about things like profit and investment and interest. He understood that we live in an earthly kingdom where money and wealth, treasure, is necessary. Like most of you, I have um, a financial consultant, planner, who helps me understand how money works. You know, IRAs, Roth IRAs, 403Bs, retirement funds, college funds, money markets. All this stuff sounds like Greek to me. I just kind of glaze over, right? I'm just not a financial guy. Many of you have the same thing. We've gotten our sons started as well. And I think the Lord, I think God himself would approve of a sound earthly investment strategy. I think he wants us to be wise with our resources. We've gotten our boys started too. As a church, we think this is important. We think it's important to help people understand how their money works for them and how it works in God's kingdom. We offer Financial Peace University several times during the year to help people get a handle on how to manage finances. 
from a kingdom perspective. Uh, our Shepherd's Heart Food, our Shepherd's Heart Care Center offers financial counsel for people who use our food pantry on a daily basis. You may not see it, but on Wednesday nights, almost every room in the lower level of that side of our East Campus is full of people getting financial counsel just to learn how to, how to handle their resources because they're using our food pantry to need help. We offer, uh, we're starting to offer estate planning seminars as a church to help people understand how to maximize their legacy at the end of their life's work both for their own families and for kingdom purposes. I discovered by going through one of, these, one of these seminars that I, even my resources, I have the potential to give far more after my life is over than I ever dreamed possible. I have to learn how to do it, learn how it works. We think that's important. One of my visions for the future of our church is to establish an FBCG endowment fund for local and global impact, to, get, to create a destination for families who want to leave earthly treasure so that it has kingdom impact. We'll talk more about that in the years to come. This brings us to one of the most important truths about earthly kingdom stuff. And that is this. Everything goes back in the box at the end of the game. I like to say first we go in the box, then everything else goes back in the box, right? It's temporary. The earthly kingdom's temporary. It all goes away. We take nothing with us. That's why Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. He's referring to the inevitable decay and loss of everything in the earthly kingdom. Clothing eaten by moth. That's what he's talking about. The clothing of the day was eaten by moths. We don't have all that same trouble today, but in that day they did. Accumulated wealth stolen by thieves because they buried it in the ground or buried it in the walls of their homes. It was stolen. So while we live in an earthly kingdom that requires an earthly investment strategy, there's got to be more than that. And there is because there's a second kingdom. Those who call him king, those who live in his kingdom, are to have a heavenly investment strategy because we also live in a heavenly kingdom. Now what does that mean? Well, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, as Jesus talks about it, refers to the eternal spiritual kingdom over which Jesus rules as king. And the Bible teaches us that there are only two things that we come into contact in our earthly lives that are eternal. Only two things. One is the word of God itself that the Bible says will never fade. It's eternal. And the other is human beings people sitting next to you, the people in your town, people in your school, people who are created with eternal souls. Only two things you touch in your whole life that are eternal, that last forever. The Word of God and the souls of the people around you. So our understanding of the kingdom of God begins with that which is eternal. And by the way, this is why the events of the past week in our nation are so heartbreaking and tragic. Because people are eternal. Every human being was created for an eternal relationship with the God who made them. And the events that have happened, as we watch them, should create pain, not just because of violence, not just because of racial tension, but because of human beings. Everybody's soul is the same color. Our skins are different, but everybody's soul is the same. That will create deep pain in us who live in the heavenly kingdom as well as the earthly kingdom. And this leads us to the gospel. The gospel... Uh, expressed beautifully in just one verse, John 3, 16. You all know it by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It all comes together right there. That's why we celebrate last month in June when at the end of Vacation Bible School, 96 children prayed to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. 96. That's 96 souls safe for all eternity if the gospel is true we celebrate that so we celebrate some 26 high school students and leaders who took the step of baptism just a couple of weeks ago in ecuador three of my sons were baptized in this same exact location i had the privilege of baptizing them one there that might be the largest group we've ever had baptized on that particular trip we celebrate that we celebrate the eternal nature of that decision the gospel tells us that we offer Ministries like Masterpiece and Buddy Break to families with children with special needs because those children are created in the image of God himself and have eternal worth in his eyes. So we do those ministries with joy. Many of you serve in Royal Family Kids Camp. Why do we take time to put on a camp for foster children in our county? Because those children, even if they're abused and neglected by their own families, are created in the image of an eternal God for an eternal relationship with Himself, and they have eternal value 
in his eyes. The gospel tells us that the young men served by a ministry called Stephen's House in Ukraine, one of our Serve the World partners last year, a vision created by a woman who grew up in this church. These are young men in Ukraine with severe special needs, completely abandoned by their own culture. We invest money in building a home for them. Why? Because they are eternal souls created in the image of eternal God. The gospel tells us all of this. And then the gospel leads us to what Jesus calls the way of generosity. See, here at FBCG, we believe that generosity can be defined as freedom from smallness of heart. And that generosity lies at the heart of everything good God wants to do in us and in his kingdom. Furthermore, the gospel itself is the expression of the generosity of God himself. Listen to the verse again. For God so loved the world that he, what's the next word? Gave. He gave. Here's how the generosity of God works. God gave out of his love. For God so loved that he gave. And what did he give? His son with great sacrifice. So that we might be set free. But the generosity of God doesn't stop there. It's not just a spiritual thing. It means the gift, everything we have is a gift from God. Everything we have falls into this world of generosity, way of generosity. Listen to Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, writing to people living in the first century. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can build your own little personal kingdoms all over the world? That's not what it says. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. My wife, Lorene, as many of you know, runs or leads our women's ministries here at FBCG, and one of our quiet sort of behind-the-scenes ministry, unless you're involved in it, is to single moms. We probably have close to 50 single moms now uh, on our... uh, on the list who participate in this ministry and they have have brunches and seminars and stuff like that. And um, a couple of stories bubbled up over the last year out of that group uh, that demonstrate the power of generosity. I'll keep them anonymous because uh, there's real people involved, but as you would guess, single moms are, as a group, often faced with financial struggles, severe financial struggles. But a while back, one single mom um, came into, uh, just by uh, a, a weird set of circumstances, um, a, little extra, a little extra money. And so you would think that, in, our, in the typical way of thinking, if you've lived without for a long time, if you've lived on the edge of financial ruin for a long time, if you had a little extra, you would make sure you held on to as much of it as you could. That would make some sense in the earthly way of thinking, right? But this single mom came to my wife and said, look, Uh, I think God's blessed me. I think he's blessed me so I can bless somebody else. Do you know any other single moms going through a really hard time right now? I want to give them a gift anonymously. So my wife knew of somebody. And and she told, yes, I know. And so the woman was overjoyed to give a gift anonymously. My wife delivered it to another woman. And that woman was so overwhelmed that came at just the right time in her life that she eventually came back to my wife and said, you know, I now now have something to give back to. Do you know anybody else who could use this gift? And it went on like three generations. The dominoes kept falling. You see, in the kingdom of God, in the heavenly kingdom, generosity produces more generosity, not less. And that's what Jesus meant in Luke 6 when he says, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Secondly, Jesus here talks about two ways of seeing. Two ways of seeing. I'm sure you've seen those images that can be sort of seen two ways. For example, take a look at this image. How many of you see a young woman? How many of you see an old woman with a big nose with a shawl on? Okay. How many of the first people just saw the old woman and didn't see the young? Okay. All right. 
Check out this one. Try this one. How many of you see a vase? How many see two faces looking at each other? How many see both? Okay, right? I think that's what we see here in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what Jesus says. The, amp is the, lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I think he's talking about two ways of seeing the world around us. One is seeing the earthly kingdom, that is, seeing the world around us from an earthly perspective. The earthly kingdom says, get as much as you can, as fast as you can, and then use what you have to build and maintain your own personal kingdom. That's how we live in our culture. We call it financial security. We call it standard of living. But that's really what we mean, building our own kingdoms. A couple thousand years ago, the writer of Proverbs in verse uh, 11 of chapter 18 says, The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Problem is, when you live inside your own kingdom at those high walls, you don't see anything else. You don't see out. Because the second way of seeing is seeing the heavenly kingdom. This other world that we live in, seeing the way Jesus sees which is to see that the only investment we ever make that has an eternal, unending return is that which is invested in the heavenly kingdom, the kingdom of God. Let me give you a few examples. Serve the World, as you might know, is our initiative as a church to make the gospel visible around the world and locally through local and global ministry partners that are doing stuff that we can't do ourselves, so we support them. Partners like LifeWater in Africa, redeeming and reclaiming village after village in Africa through freshwater wells. Just water, which leads to gospel transformation, which leads to lives and villages changed. Through a manual house in Aurora, breaking the cycle of generational poverty by helping families eventually purchase their own homes, changes everything about a city when people begin to own their own homes. We support that ministry. Some of you do too. Samaritan Aviation in Papua New Guinea, where their own John and Carrie Smith, who grew up and were baptized in this church, he flies planes now for Samaritan Aviation, bringing medical care and the gospel to some of the most remote parts of the earth. By the way, our Vacation Bible School kids raised almost $2,000 to send to Samaritan Aviation in June. We recently passed the $1 million mark just in the last three years of money given above and beyond our budgets just to serve the world partners. Over a million dollars in less than three years. In addition to that, over the past 12 months, we've had over 100 first-time gifts to FBCG. Over 100 families gave for the first time to FBCG. Now, we rejoice and celebrate in that not just because we get a little, we get extra money, not because of that, but because over 100 families have allowed the gospel to create generosity in their hearts. Over 100 families starting to see the way Jesus sees. And that's exciting. And every dollar invested in the kingdom of God has an eternal return on investment. That's exciting. Finally, Jesus here talks about two masters. Two masters. This summer we have 13 uh, interns in what we call Leadership Institute. We have 13 uh, mostly college students taking their summers to learn about ministry, to work here at the church, to investigate whether God is calling them to uh, ministry as, uh, for careers. And it's really fun to be around them. They're excited. They're young, they're energetic, gifted. There's one of them back there. Anton is one of our is one of our interns. He's the one up here leading us in worship on Saturday nights. But it's a great thing. And Jeff and I share the teaching as, along with Ali. Um, uh, Gobel, and I've been teaching about leadership, the definition of leadership and so forth, and I've been defining leadership as the journey between idea or vision and destination or execution. Leadership is a journey from here to there, moving a group of people from here to there for a purpose. And I've said there's two kinds of leadership in the world. There's positional leadership, which is built around title and power and authority, and there's relational leadership, which is built around inspiration and passion. And there are two kinds of motivation in the world. There's have to motivation and there's want to motivation. Have to and want to. I think Jesus is talking a little bit about that in the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. He's saying that every human being on the face of the earth, every human being on the face of the earth, every one of you in this room today, serves one of two masters. God 
what Jesus calls God, Yahweh, Jehovah, God of heaven and earth, creator of all things, sovereign and eternal over all things. God, that God, big G. Or what he calls money, or in some translations, mammon, which is the name of a pagan idol given to demonstrate the power of earthly treasure. That which is of this world and temporary. Jesus says, our values, our priorities, our way of seeing ourselves and the world around us is shaped by the master we serve. Everything comes down to who your master is. And three things are always true, and I hope you listen to this. Three things are always true about human beings. Always. First, our master determines our devotion. Our master will determine who or what we worship. If our master is money, then inevitably we will offer our extravagant devotion, our worship to our wealth or to that which brings us our wealth, our work. John Orberg, pastor in California, has said that money is the temple of the 21st century. If our master is God, creator of all things, then we give our worship to him and we allow him to shape how we see and use our wealth. You see how that works? Second thing that's true, our master will determine our service. If our master is money, we will eventually serve money. Most recent statistics I've seen says that the average American household is carrying $15,000 of credit card debt. If you've ever been in debt, you know that money is a terrible, enslaving, heartless taskmaster. It cares not for your soul. It cares not. You will serve that money if you allow it to be your God. If our master is God, we serve him and our wealth will serve him as well. Finally, thirdly, and this is true, our hearts have room for only one master. We may think we can carry many masters, but we can't. We only have one. Notice Jesus says this is an either or proposition. Can't have it both ways. We will serve one or the other. It's just how we're wired up as human beings. Just how we're made. Something sits at the top of the food chain of our lives, our hearts, our priorities, everything. Something's there. The master called money or mammon is unforgiving, impersonal, temporary, and above all else, selfish. The master called God is forgiving, personal, eternal, and above all else, generous. I came across a letter this week. I was looking through some old files on other old sermons and stuff. came across something I found years ago. I don't even remember when I found it. Probably going through old boxes of archives uh, in some attic room we were tearing apart something or whatever but i found this letter the letter was dated october 18th 1944 addressed from the first baptist church anderson boulevard at hamilton if you recognize this image uh, this is the original first baptist church actually first swedish baptist church of geneva it was built in 1904 and built on to several times it still exists downtown geneva another church inhabits that building now but these are our ancestors so this letter was written by the pastor at that time, a man named Lloyd Tebow, who I never knew, don't know anything about. It might have been there for a couple of years. They had a lot of interim pastors during that time. They were even part-time. And here's the letter he wrote to that little congregation in 1944. Dear members and friends, October 24, 1944 is the 50th anniversary of our First Baptist Church of Geneva. We feel that it is altogether fitting and proper that we observe this great occasion. However, with so many of our members <coughs> excuse me, and friends engaged in war work, 1944, some on night shifts and others on day shifts, we feel that observing this occasion on a weeknight, there would be many who would be unable to attend. Therefore, we are celebrating on Sunday, October 22nd. See, the 24th would have been a Tuesday night. So they're celebrating on the 22nd. A couple of these early, he's explaining why. Because they're all working sh factory shifts because of the war. Trusting this will make it more convenient for all. Now, it struck me when I read that part of the letter. I'll read more that they were in the midst of the greatest war humanity had ever known, 1944. You know, we look out at our world and we see terrorism, we see ISIS, we see racial discord and violence, and we can kind of think, we're, now we're all, only ones dealing with all this. In 1944, the whole world was on fire. They didn't know what was going to happen. And their people are working all night. That, that just struck me. The world hasn't changed much in the last 70 years. 
Same stuff. Then he writes, Gratitude to God and our forefathers should characterize our golden jubilee year. The best expression of that appreciation is the perpetuation of the heritage that is ours. Is it not gratifying that in a time of war when many religious bodies are curtailing their activities, God is enabling us to go forward? This year, many improvements have been made on the church property. In January, the church auditorium was redecorated. In July, the church was reshingled. And we've just finished redecorating the basement with new paint. We know that everyone is rejoicing over these improvements and we'll be glad to learn that the church debt has been brought down, listen to this, from $2,500 to $1,400 this past year. Let each one of us ask the Lord what he would have us do to wipe out this church debt within the next few months. It is we and not the Lord that fix the limits of our blessings. Our capacity to receive, not his capacity to give, is the acid test. There's incredible wisdom in those words. May we ask and expect great things from God during our Jubilee year and every subsequent year that he may give us. Now, think about that for just a moment. The people who opened their hearts to give that last $1,400 in 1944. People we'll never meet until heaven someday. Could have had no idea that their gifts, their generosity, earned in all-night factory jobs during a war effort would allow FECG to move from that location to this location here on South Street in 1962, 18 years later. And then to build the East Campus Sanctuary in 1984. And then to add the West Campus in 2004. And to consider adding a third campus in the near future, as Jeff said on his video. We'll talk about that tomorrow at the church family meeting. I believe in kingdom economics. That $1,400 investment led to over 1,000 people a month today being served by our Shepherd's Heart Care Center. Over 100 children giving their hearts to Jesus this year alone through our ministries. 26 students and leaders baptized in Ecuador. Over 200 students and adults serving in short-term teams just this summer. Serve the world partners like the HIV Hospital Clinic in Nigeria we've supported over the years, Stevens House in Ukraine, El Refugio in Ecuador, we just got a team back from there. Videos created by Middle East ministries that are going all over the Muslim world with the hope of Jesus Christ. To families with children with special needs experiencing the love of Christ at Buddy Break. I could go on and on and on, but that $1,400 investment in 1944 has reproduced itself a hundred times, a thousand times, 10,000 times, maybe a million times times and I dare you to find another investment that will repay that amount and here's the question for me as I read that letter that's almost 70 years old now what's our investment going to be what's our investment going to be which kingdom will we invest in will we invest intentionally in that which yields an eternal return or accidentally and that which in, that which gives us no eternal return 50 years from now, or 100 years from now, will someone look back at the FBCG of 2016 and say, wow, what if those people had not been so generous? Will someone look back and say that? The way of blessing is the way of generosity. Jesus said it this way, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for the generosity of your grace showered upon us in so many ways. Forgive us for living sometimes only in this earthly kingdom. It dominates our attention, captures our hearts. Forgive us sometimes for failing to see your heavenly kingdom at work all around us. Teach us your way of blessing. Set our hearts free from smallness of this world that we become more and more generous in every way, even as you are so generous to us. We pray these things in your name. Amen.